All right, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Psalm 19. I, uh, I love verses of Scripture like this. And uh, when you get there, please stand and we'll read the Word of God together. Or I'll read it and you'll read along. We'll be reading verses 1 through 6. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath He set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom, coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word this morning, that how it's proclaimed to us, and we, and we thank you for how your word is proclaimed to us too in, in creation, Lord, that as we see it, we can see the mighty power of your hands. And Lord, this morning I pray, that your, your hand will be on everyone here, Lord, that they would hear your word, that they would go out and live your word. And, Lord, I just pray that you would speak through me this morning, Lord, that uh, I don't say any words that come from myself, but, Lord, that they come from you. I pray for your inspiration and your anointing. And, Lord, I just pray that you would do the same for everybody here. Lord, that we, can't, we know that we can't hear and understand your word unless we have the Holy Spirit. And, Lord, I just pray that uh, uh, you will be with every one of us here this morning. Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we love you, Lord. And it's in your son's most precious name we pray. Amen. All right, so I love Bible verses uh, like what's uh, contained here in Psalm 19. And, I'll, and we'll visit a few other ones this morning as well. But, you know, what I want to focus on and, and think about, you know, when we look out at the earth, when we look out at the heavens, what do we think of? You know, what do we think uh, they're saying to us? There's a lot of people that spend the majority of their lives studying these things. We've got, you know, geologists, zoologists, astronomers, you know, biologists, all these things. Uh, you know, these different fields of study and science. And basically what they're doing is they're trying to study nature. Things that God has made and they're trying to figure out how they work, how they come about. Um, but what I see here in Psalm 19, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens, the earth, they're saying something to us. Or better yet, God is saying something to us through them. You know, they show His great power. You know, we see this in verses like Psalm 19, and even in Psalm 148, verses 3 through 5 says, Praise ye Him, sun and moon, Praise Him, all you stars of light. Praise Him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them that praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded, and they were created. So He's saying all the things that He created, the, the seas, the heavens, the earth, the stars, the moon, the sun, all those praise God. They said, let them praise God, because they are created from Him, His handiwork. You know, if, if you have an artist... You know, and, and he draws a, a picture, creates a painting, a sculpture. You know, that piece of work shows off his power, his skill, you know, his artistic ability. You know, and so, you know, that's what the creation does with God, that it shows, up his, shows off his power. Now this, and it's spoken in a language that everybody can understand. We see in verse 3, it says, There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. All over the world, no matter what your language is, no matter uh, you know, how you talk, how you understand things, God has said the same thing throughout history, throughout all times, to all people, that He is there. When they look at the creation, they see evidence that God is there. In the book of Romans 1, chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, one of my favorite verses... It says, Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clear, clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
So the things that are made, even the invisible things that make up the things that we can see, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, they show evidence of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It shows evidence of the Godhead and His power. You know, and it says, so they are without excuse. So anybody in the world has no excuse to not believe that there is a God. You know, we see that in the heavens. You know, and, and I, I talk about sometimes, you know, we need to be able to look at things outside with our heart and our eyes tuned into God and seeing His creation. We need to look at each other and, and see God's creation. Somebody made and formed in His image. You know, but we look out at creation and we see only a fraction of it. You know, we see the trees, we see the leaves, the grass, the animals, but we don't see the things that are behind it, the forces that are working. In Hebrews 11, verse 3, and this is the chapter on faith, but in verse 3 it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things that do appear. And if you take any science class, any biology class, you'll see that to be true. You know, that things that we see are made of things that we really can't see. You know, when you get down on a cellular level, the, you know, the atoms that everything is made up of. You know, we know of water to be made of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. But, you know, we can't see what links them together. We can't see the inner workings, how many electrons and protons and neutrons all these things have. You know, and they've, uh, if you've seen in the news this Hadron Collider, it's off in Europe somewhere, what their focus is, is looking for something they call the God particle. Okay, it's the Higgs boson. It's what its technical name is. But the God particle. And what that is, is the thing, the force that holds everything together. You know, when you get those two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, what's holding them together? You know, uh, or salt, sodium chloride. What's holding the sodium and the chloride together? Or chlorine, it's two things of chlorine. Sodium and chlorine. Chlorine makes salt. That makes a lot of sense, right? No, it don't. But when you put them together, there's something that holds them together that makes salt. And scientists are trying to discover what that is. And they can't find it. They call it the God particle. And so we see uh, that there's evidence of a force behind everything that's made, everything that's put together. We can't understand. We can't try to understand it. But yet we know that something is there causing it to hold together. You know, if you watch the news much, you may, well, there's got to be some kind of force there holding Donald Trump's hair. And it, you know, it's, it's just, you know, it, is similar. You know, we look on a cellular level uh, and see these things. There's something that holds it together, a force that we can't understand. There's a lot of money being spent in science trying to figure this out. And, and we, dis, we see as Christians, as studiers of the Bible, a, as followers of Jesus Christ, we see that these things declare God's glory and power. You know, if that force that holds those atoms together ever went away, I would be mass chaos. I mean, everything would just... I mean, you think, just take water, for instance. You know, we are, I, I think it's like 70, 80, 90 percent water is what I learned in elementary school. I can't remember it, so I don't really guess I did, learned it. 75 is what Sleep says. You know, so if the water atoms could not hold together, you know, we would probably explode. And, you know, we see God's hand in everything. You know, when you read the book of Job, or you read Psalms, or you read even Isaiah, and I, I see these scriptures, and, and it puts me in awe a lot of times as I read them to see how in tune they are to God and His power in creation. You know, uh, you know there's a scripture that talks about the earth, says you hang it on nothing. You know, knowing at that time that the earth hung upon nothing in outer space. You know, and, and I talked uh, with the teenagers this morning in Job 38, 39, 40, and 41, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. You know, how the things that it explains in those chapters, what God is explaining, it 
To me, it boggles my mind that we knew that way back then, but then we had to, say, discover it thousands of years later. You know, everything from the water cycle, everything from ocean currents, uh, how important blood is to a human being, all that is found in the Bible, but we didn't understand that until later on. You know how ocean currents were discovered? I can't remember the guy's name, but he read it in the Bible. I think it said the paths of the sea is what he saw. And he's like, you know what? Is there, you know, like currents in the ocean? And he went out and discovered it. Um, I, don't, I also read a story a little while back that the guy that uh, was a big innovator in anesthesia got it from Genesis where God put Adam to sleep to take out his rib. You know, and even... You know, a couple hundred years ago, we was just getting people drunk and having them bite down on something while we did surgery on them. You know, there wasn't any anesthesia, but we see God did it way before then. And so we see all these things that declare God's glory. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 16 through 18, it says, But they have not obeyed the gospel. All obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah, or Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. All these things, you know, and this is not particularly talking about the gospel in verse 18. It's talking about the evidence of God, going back to Romans 1, is seen unto all the earth. God has sent his witness out into all the world, the evidence of his creation. And we, for the most part, I think now, ignore it. You know, uh, I've always been intrigued by the seed. You know, when we had a revival and Floyd Massey was up here and said that there's life in a seed. If, and I'm, you know, I thought about earlier in the week, I should have had a pumpkin seed up here. You cut a pumpkin seed open, you don't see nothing in particular. It's just all white. You know, it, it, you don't see nothing that say, hey, that's going to grow them to a pumpkin plant or an acorn. You know, you cut an acorn open, you're not, you don't see an oak tree in that. You know, we can't understand it. But, you know, we don't pay attention to things like that. You see an acorn, it's like, all right, that's good. That's something good to throw at my brother. You know, or it's or something that squirrels eat. You know, we don't look at how God works in and of and around everything that we see. You know, even, you know, even uh, in, in school, our kids, they're uh, exposed to things like evolution where there's no biblical base to it. Christians, there's a lot of Christians that say, well, God used evolution. That's not biblically based either. You know, and there's no evidence of evolution, truly. You know, they'll say that, uh, okay, here's this missing link. Well, there'll be many experts look at it and say, well, that's a monkey. It's not a missing link. It's, we, you don't see the evidence, but th that's the theory that's promoted the most today. And what it is is man's attempt to figure out how we got here without God. You know, and I took a biology class in college here recently. And to hear them explain the theory of evolution, and it may be my naivety, my ignorance, uh, but I'm thinking, people actually believe this? You know, because basically you've got this primordial soup, this liquid, that things grew in, basically life came from non-life. That's what they say. Life came from non-life. And that's not possible. You know, non-life cannot beget life. And there's rules and, uh, of, and laws of physics and laws of nature that contradict that. But, you know, they ignore it because they cannot and will not believe that God has created the earth. You know, as Psalm 14, 1, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. But yet we have seen the evidence of it. And that's why a person is called a fool when they say that there is no God because the evidence is all around us. You know, and we become kind of like Job was. You know, when Job was going through these things in his life, he was sick, he had sores, he had boils all over his skin, he had lost his family, lost all his possessions. And, you know, it was... 
we can look at that and say, you know what, he probably had a right to be kind of stressed out a little bit. We think he may have had a right to be sorrowful. But when we read the book of Job and how he uh, wanted God to stand before him, he said, I want God right here so I can question him. I want God right here so I can ask him why this is happening because I'm a good man. He said, I'm a righteous man. Why is God doing this to me? And I mentioned Job 38, 39, 40, and 41. Those are chapters where God speaks to Job. And, and, and I challenge you and I recommend you go home and read them. And what, basically what he tells them, God says, who are you? He, said, he mentions a couple of creatures he created, Behemoth and Leviathan, and says, there is no man that can stand before them, so you think you're going to stand before their creator and question him and, and bring him down to your level to say that there may be something wrong? That's what Job had done. Because what he had also done is he failed to recognize God's power in all of creation. You know, we see that, and, and I think it's imperative. I've spent some time with the youth. I've spent some time with my kids uh, studying these things. We did things on Sunday night to kind of look at God's power in creation and, and how a biblical view of these things is possible. Of course it's possible if we believe it. If we say we're a Christian, we better believe it's possible. But so we look at Genesis 1-1, and, and I've had... I've heard preachers say, and I believe this, if you can believe Genesis 1-1, you have no problem with anything else in the Bible. You shouldn't. Not with any miracles or, or any you know, resurrections or any healings. Any of that, you shouldn't have no problem with. The sun standing still, the sundial, the shadow moving back a certain amount of degrees. If we believe that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, we shouldn't have no problem believing anything else. But we have skeptics uh, in Christianity all over the place. And, and it drives me nuts. You know, Floyd Massey, when he was here, mentioned, he said, you won't believe the things they teach you in seminary. Well, he's right. They, they teach some weird stuff. And uh, I'm thankful that I'm at the point where I am uh, as far as how I believe the Bible and grounded in my faith so they can't influence that. When you go into a, a class and one of the first things they tell you is the first 11 chapters of Genesis is all myth, I have a problem with that. Because I believe Genesis 1-1 where it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then in verse 2 it says, uh, The earth was, out form, was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. You know, God has created something out of nothing. That's the only way something can come out of nothing. And is through God. There is no laws of nature or theories that can explain that. However, when we look at Genesis 1 and he has nothing, Everything is without form and void. In verse 3, God said, let there be light. And, so, and in that light, God has given us light. God has given us the revelation of Him through His creation. And then when we look at Psalm 8, and many of you should be familiar with this psalm, but verses 3 and 4, When I consider thy heavens... The work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. We look at God's power in creation. And, and David, as he wrote Psalm 8, he's thinking, you know, when I look at all these things out there, what, what am I? What am I? And he has given all of us light as well in the form of Jesus Christ. And he does it to all men. It says, what is man that thou visitest him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. That all generations, not just one generation, but generation after generation, the son of man. You know, these are, God has come to us. He has manifested himself in, in Jesus Christ. You know, and at one time all men are without form. They're void. They've got darkness upon them. They live in the dark because they don't have that light in their life. But when we have that light of Jesus Christ in our life, we can be transformed. We can be different people. And when you, when you look at, say, darkness, you think, what is darkness? And I think the proper definition is darkness basically is the absence of light. When you don't have that light of Jesus Christ in your life. And, I, and we can't imagine, I don't think, true darkness 
You know, I, I know in some places, like if you go into caves, they'll get you way down deep in there and they'll turn out the lights. And, and, they, and the way I've heard people describe it is that's just a heavy darkness. You, know, you just can't see nothing because there's no light in there at all. You know, and even the darkest times in our life, I think that we can kind of relate to is at night. But when we walk outside at night, I don't care where you're at, you're going to see some light. You know, we see the stars of heaven. And, they, and when I took astronomy, basically said that was points of light. So even when it's dark, we have a little bit of light. And see, what's great when we look at verse 5, when it, talking about the sun, it said, which is as a bridegroom cometh out of his chamber, rejoiceth as a strong man to run his race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. What other places do we see the term bridegroom used in Scripture? When talking about Jesus Christ, that he is the bridegroom, the church is the bride. You know, and so here I see it as, as associating the Son with Jesus Christ. You know, it talks about if, when we should know, I think, that, we, that their life cannot exist on this planet or any other planet or these planets probably wouldn't exist without the sun. It says nothing is hid from the heat thereof. You can't go anywhere on this earth where you hide from the heat sun, the heat of the sun. You know, even if when you go into the darkest, deepest cave, compared to last night, it was a balmy 56 degrees. You know, that's what uh, roughly what the temperature is. Why? Because the heat of the sun. You know, the sun goes through that far. Now, some will say, you know, the core of the earth, the, the, uh, the inner core that's heated. And, but the heat of the sun goes everywhere. You know, and if you think about it, the sun is one, let's see, the closest star to us besides the sun is 4.2 light years away. Now, I'm not even going to try to say that in a number because I can't. Uh, but a light year is the distance that light travels in a year. And that's roughly 186,000 miles per second. So however many seconds are in a year, you multiply that by 186,000. That's the distance that light can travel in a year. Uh, the light from the sun, to tell you how far it is away from us, takes about seven and a half years to get here. But nothing is hid from the heat thereof. Without the sun, life doesn't exist here. Without Jesus Christ, eternal life doesn't exist for us. You know, we are in darkness. We are in spiritual darkness without Jesus Christ. We look at John 1, and it says that uh, in him was life. In him, and it was the light of men, but it says that men love darkness rather than the light. There's a lot of people that refuse to live in the light. They want to live in the darkness. I don't know if they think it's more fun. I don't know if they think they just can't handle it. I know I see a lot of people, they don't want to come face to face with their own sin because that's part of that light being shined into our life. It sheds light on our sin. But... We can remember that the darkest human being can receive light. You know, we know that God can change us. We have hope. You know, you may have loved ones that's living a lifestyle that uh, you can tell that they're in spiritual darkness. You know, or they may not be saved. We know that through Jesus Christ, there is hope. We know that through Jesus Christ, there is light that can come into their life. You know, as all, all creation declares His glory, we, as born-again, blood-bought, changed, transformed sinners, show His glory as well. You know, to me, there's nothing more glorifying to God than seeing somebody who was a sinner be saved, to come to Christ. You know, that is what we should be looking for.
to happen in and around our lives as church's life. And as born-again sinners, as bought by Jesus Christ, we should be showing that glory of God. As the heavens and the earth declare the glory of God, we should be declaring the glory of God. Ephesians 2.10 says we are his workmanship. We are to go out and show people that God has done a work in us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, as Paul is writing to him, he says something to him that, you know, a, a couple years ago I saw this and I just thought it was so profound, but I got to remember that the Holy Spirit was inspiring Paul when he wrote this. It says, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us. Now he's saying, You guys are the letter of Christ. You know, Paul, he wrote letters to all kinds of churches, but he said, you are the letter. He says, you are the witness, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. We are the letter to all peoples showing what Jesus Christ can do in our life. They've got the witness of creation, and if they know us, they should know Jesus Christ because we should be telling them about it. You know, we should have it written in our hearts. You know, it says not written with ink, but written by the Spirit of the living God. And so we are to be, to show that light of Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 5, uh, Paul is writing to him. He says, be children of the day, not children of the night. You know, show that light in our lives. You know, I talked about Job earlier in uh, 38, 39, 40, and 41, how God had kind of responded to all his questioning. And in Job 42, Job admits, he said, you know what? I realize now you can do everything. The King James word is, thou canst do everything. That's what he said. You can do everything. You know, and Job come to that realization. And I think that a lot of times as Christians, we limit God. We don't believe that he can do everything. I mean, I've had Christians say, well, how did God create everything in six days? Six days. they saying, God can't do all that in six days. I'm going to tell you, I know some people. Some of them have come in this church before. I know, I, I know one guy in particular. Uh, skinhead. Not just a shaved head. He was in the group, the skinhead. Racist. You know, uh, tattooed all over, had Nazi symbols on him. Uh, from California, there's a, you know, there's a big group of them out there. And uh, I'd been kind of trying to get in touch with him here a while back. And uh, he sent me a message on Facebook. He said, man, you'll be, you'll be happy to know. He said, I found Jesus Christ. He said, I'm attending a church. He's living in Lebanon. And, and that, to me, shows more power, more glory to God than anything that we can see outside creation. Now, we see God's power in creation, but his transforming power inside of us, that we can have eternal life, that we can be saved, we can be forgiven of our sins, that's greater than anything. And that, today, is what I want us to take hold of, is there is power in the gospel, there is power in Jesus Christ, the light of the world as he comes and lives inside of us. If you have drove by Hickman uh, Baptist Church, the sign that they got up today, it says, uh, basically saying that the man that... The being that created the world lives inside of us. And I don't think people understand that. I don't think people take a hold of that. That we have God, in, the Holy Spirit, living inside of us. When Jesus left and he said, Look, you're going to be able to say to this mountain, Move from there to over here. Why? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's going to be able to, he said he would do greater wonders than what they could do while Jesus was here. And we have that living inside of us. But yet we don't recognize the power of God that's around us and inside of us. So as Cleet and Cheryl come up for the invitation, I'm going to leave you with Psalm 150. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. 
Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. You know, in some translations that praise you, the Lord is hallelujah. That's what it means. And so this morning we know that we, there is power inside of us. There's transforming power. There's power that can defeat addictions. There's power that can overcome sin. There's power that can overcome temptation. And if you don't have that power in your life, then you need to submit to Jesus Christ and let that light in your life. So we have the altar here open, and, and it's open for any need that you may have. Let us stand and sing.